Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. I also join my leader in congratulating you for assuming the most prestigious office constitution post for the second consecutive day. Since I also hold a very important position in the party, on behalf of the party, I also would like to congratulate our Honourable CM for assuming the post of Chief Minister for the fifth day. I also would like to congratulate our lady colleagues, Honourable Minister Mrs. Sumitano Kose and my friend Hikani Chakalo Pense for making it to this house. In fact, I'm excited because I attempted the past three elections and I felt when I won, two of the lady friends joined me. So, in fact, uh, I'm the most happiest of all. Well, I, I rise to move men to the governor's address. Since this is my maiden speech, Honorable Speaker, sir, as per the parliamentary procedures and conventions, I may be allowed to touch here and there as I go on with my speech. I would like to quote William Shakespeare before I proceed, where he said, Some are born great, some achieve greatness, some are trust upon, some are, some, some are greatness trust upon them. I would like to remind the honorable members of this 14th house that we are in the third category, that we are not born great, neither we have achieved greatness, but greatness has been trust upon us. We are all responsible people for our, to take our people forward. As far as the First Amendment is concerned, my leader has elaborated in detail. To save time, I will not dwell on that. I would like to come back to the Second Amendment, that is the narrow political issue. My leader has already pointed out that this party, from the day one of its formation, the main objective is to bring about an honorable, acceptable and inclusive solution to the Naga political issue. A party that was formed in a very crucial period and 12 of them won, as he has mentioned, from this party and the resigning bloc thinking that they, they had done their job because a ceasefire was came in between the, at that point of time it was the NNC of GN and the government of India. And after that, even in 1998, when the ceasefire was signed between the NSC and I and the government of India in United with effect on 1st of August 1997, the assembly election was announced and there was a call from the civil society that the political parties must refrain from participating in the election. And this party responded positively and we did not participate even in the 1998 election on this Naga political issue. Today, we went to the electorates with the same objective, our man manifesto. In the manifesto we have mentioned about solving the Naga political issue. If we don't raise this in the first assembly, we will be failing our electorates as promised during the election. I would like to refresh our memories because it is important to know from where we have come. At least we will know where we are heading for. As we, have, as we all are fully aware, the Naga Club was formed in 1980 and the formation of this club was actually political in nature. On the 10th of January 1929, they have submitted a memorandum to Sir Simon Commission, who was visiting our land. And I don't want to go into all detail, but Speaker Sir, with your permission, I would like to read out the last portion of the memorandum which was submitted to the Simon Commission. This was, according to the record, drafted by one Rezekro, a, a high school teacher. Of course, the record also, also shows that a Kasi gentleman has also assisted in the, in the usage of the language. The last part says that we should not be trust 
to the mercy of other people who could never be subject subjected, but to leave us alone to determine ourselves as in ancient times. We claim not only the members of the Naga Club to represent those regions to which we belong. They have mentioned about Angami, Nota, Sema, Rima, but they have also mentioned Kajanamas. This is a very deep political meaning because they have stated that to leave us alone to determine ourselves as in ancient times. Meaning to say that Nagas are independent before even the advent of the British. Forget about India becoming independent with the fact of 15 August 1947. And this is where our people have taken a stand. This is the position of the Naga people from 1929 till today. Now, when they mention Kacha Nagas, speaker sir, it, they, were, they meant Nagas outside the present state of Nagaland. Today, we have reduced ourselves into Nagas of Nagaland, Nagas of Arunachal, Nagas of Manipur, Nagas of uh, Burma, Nagas of Assam. Why should we make ourselves such a small people, speaker sir? When our leaders with less education, with less exposure, could think of a, could have a vision for the entire Naga people. Kaja Nagas means the Nagas living outside the present state of Naga. That was what they meant. Which also includes the Nagas of Burma. That this is how the Naga Club represented in the Simon Commission. Now, this the letter which was dispatched to the Simon Commission. The, the, at that point of time, the Deputy Commissioner of the Naga Hill District, because we were a part of Assam, no Kohima, no Mawosu uh, District. So James Houghton was the Deputy Commissioner. And according to the report that he had seen the memorandum before it was presented to the Simon Commission, because it has to go through him, the Deputy Commissioner. But he made no changes in that memorandum. Now, instead of changing the memorandum which was drafted by the Naga Club, he has sent a note, a separate note, to the Simon Commission. And I would like to quote with your permission, just a small portion, that none of these tribes, this is what J.H. Hodden, this is not my language, but the language written by J.H. Hodden, none of these tribes are Indians at all within a credit form. The true solution of the, of the question of this, of their administration, is the gradual creation of self-governing communities semi-independent in nature. This is how he strongly supported the memorandum drafted, submitted by the Simon Commission. I mean, by the Naga Club to the Simon Commission. Now, the very interesting part, Mr. Speaker, sir, of this memorandum is this memorandum was debated in the House of Commons, Mr. Speaker, sir. This, was, this memorandum of the Naga Club, which was a note being also supported by, the, by J. H. Hodder, was debated in the House of Commons. Debated in the House of Commons in May 1935. And I'm, I'm sure the honorable members of this house are fully aware that Naga areas are kept as excluded area, Mr. Speaker. And how this excluded area came in? Because of the debate in 1935 in the House of Commons, resulting into the Naga area being kept into excluded area. And for which we have made our foundation very strong today, claiming for a vital Naga home. Now, that was 88 years ago, the excluded area which was debated and in the House of Commons and included in, in, the, in, the, in the government of India in 1935, it was kept as excluded area. And for which, as my leader has also mentioned about the origin of the inner line permit, all this kept, but this is how the history goes. Now, in the governor's address, to this honorable house, on, to this august house, on the 21st of uh, March, the paragraph 5 and 6, 
We are happy that on the bar six, uh, he has mentioned about honorable, acceptable, and inclusive solution. But we are not satisfied with because it has not been elaborated in detail. As far as my party is concerned, honorable speaker said, we believe in shared Naga homeland, which is a part of our manifesto and a party's constitution. That integration is a birthright of the Naga people because we don't intend to encroach a land that belongs to other communities. We are only seeking for restoration of a land that belongs to our people. Because our land and our people have been divided, dissected without the consent and knowledge of the Naga people. And therefore, this is our birthright that our land should be integrated. And these are a part of the 16 point agreement as well as the 9 point agreement. Now, in that uh, bara 5 and 6, not even a whisper about the shared Naga home and Naga integration. I'm fully aware that this house, this accursed house, has passed on six occasions, about one on 12 December 1964, where assembly resolution had been passed on the Naga integration, on 28 August 1970, on 16 September 1994, on 18 December 2003, on 27 August 2015, and the last one was 20 September 2018. I would suggest if the government can consider in including the same in the first session. I would like to remind the Honorable House, the August House, that Honorable Members of the August House, that when our issue has been even debated in the House of Commons, we should be serious enough in debating this Naga political issue. Because Unless we resolve this, we are reducing ourselves to a small people. As I mentioned, many of us started talking of Nagas of Nagaland, Nagas of Assam, Arunachal. Tomorrow, after 10 years from now, Honorable Speaker, sir, some of us will be speaking, we are Nagas of Okha district, we are Nagas of Goyma district. Why can, why, how can we make ourselves, our people, to be very small? When our, our leaders, our elders can envision a nation for us. This is what I would like to advocate. And for a nation, for a, the, the Naga area is not small, Mr. Honorable Speaker, sir. If Nagas of Burma and India are integrated, we are as big as European nations like Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, and Switzerland. If this nation can progress, one of the most advanced nations of this Naga areas, and as big as, if not bigger than this. And this is the history, and I would like to come back to the present context. That the nine point agreement, of which was signed in June 1947, it has, it has become an unwanted child. Because of the, because of what? The reason was because of the interpretation of the agreement that was put in, in the paper. The clause eight of the nine point agreement says that after 10 years, Nagas will be allowed to determine whether they will continue with the same agreement or they will be allowed to again decide for their future. Now there was a creation of interpretation, Honorable Speaker, sir, that at that point of, that point of time we were represented by the NNCFGN. So from the NNCFGN point of view, they thought after 10 years, and that was what they understood, and it is correct, that Nagas should be allowed to again determine for ourselves, for our future. But from the government of India, they, they were of the opinion that no, this was signed prior to the, in the declaration of the Indian independence. And so they have inherited from the British. They, they would like, they, they went on twisting that uh, interpretation, the clause. And that's why there was a conflict of interest between the NNCFGN and the government of India where the issue that the, the agreement, nine point agreement was period, period, without any execution, without any implementation. Today, if you see 
the 2015 framework agreement signed between the NSA and IMF government of India, where they say this, this is what uh, some of the wise people say that history repeats, honorable speakers. And this is what is happening today. The NSA and IMF says that there is a portion of a sovereignty, shared sovereignty in the framework agreement. The government of India is embracing their own way. So this is how the wise people say that history repeats. It is happening today. The nine point agreement where we could not uh, take forward because of the variation of interpretation <coughs> of the agreement that has been entered. Today, what is happening today? The NSA is saying, I, I am interpreting the open, the government of India interpreting the own language. And at the end of the day, the Naga agreements are shrouded, period, in uh, reducing the semantics. Only language, playing of language. Nothing is happening on the ground. Government of India has been telling us from long before that you unite. A solution will come in. Today, if you see the accurate position of which was signed with the NNPGs again on the 17th of November 2017, and various concordance, covenant with the uh, initiations of various civil societies led by the FNR. In fact, there is in total agreement between this NNPGs and NSN and NSNI as far as the solution is concerned. There should be no pretext whatsoever. There should be no excuse again to tell us that you unite and we give solution. I think this is what is we, we should be serious on this and uh, we should pursue the upon the government of India that NAVAS yearn for early, honorable and inclusive solution. Because, Mr. Speaker, sir, solution to the Naga political issue, it is not only in the interest of the Naga people alone, it is also in the interest of the government of India, India as a nation. The government of India keeps talking about look east policy. Mr. Speaker, sir, from look east policy, they have now changed into act east policy. How do we execute this act east policy, honorable speaker, sir? Without going through the Daga areas of uh, Chinwin River, the, uh, the Burma areas and Naga areas, how do we pass through the Thailand, the Southeast Asian nations? Don't you think uh, a viable peace is required, an honorable solution is required on the Naga issue to get through their dreams and visions? It is not only in the interest of our people, but also it will be in the interest of the government of India that a solution be erected so that a corridor for economic strengthening of the economic uh, avenues for our people may also come. This is where we stand on the Naga political issue. I would like to touch upon the Bara 11 of the amendment which we have moved, the the governor in his address have mentioned about the Department of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. There are so many schemes mentioned here. We are afraid that uh, all the points have not been touched. Mr. Speaker, sir, there is a human and animal conflict. Especially I represent 40 Pandari Assembly constituents. A herd of elephants. It is almost their home. Their forest, their, their forest, their, their, their field, the battlefields are being destroyed every year. And uh, almost every year, one or two uh, human life lost. Hardly 10, 20,000 uh, they receive from the government, from the department. And there is no mitigation to this. There is no, I did not see any policy, a long-term policy on the, on the government uh, aspect, on the government side. This needs to be looked into whether, the question is, whether we, we allow the, uh, the elephants, the animal to survive, or the human to survive. There's a big question here. Unless we have the department address on this issue, the, the, the poor villagers have to abandon the battlefield, the forest, and what is the alternative for the villagers to survive? I would like to draw the attention of the government to look into this uh, aspect as you draw a, a new policies to take the government forward.
I also would like to touch upon the Para 24 of the Governor's Address, Honorable Speaker, sir. I'm happy that the government has given attention on the foothills through Transnet and Nagaland Highway. But it was mentioned only 320 kilometers. 320 kilometers. This foothill road touches about uh, the whole stretch of Assam border. Uh, covering about uh, 10, 11 tribes of Nagaland. Now, uh, in, it, it was initiated in 2013, 11 years ago now, under the uh, planning commission under a special plan fund. I hope I'm correct with my statistics. Uh, in in 20, 2014, uh, from 2014, a small fund was given in 2013 under special plan fund. So the construction started and it was under the sponsorship of the planning commission. But honorable speaker sir, you are aware the planning commission was replaced by the Niti Ayo. So after that replacement, the Niti Ayo has not taken any special interest on this road. And that's how the construction is becoming slow, rather, literally speaking, it has stopped. And therefore, this needs the attention of the government. But they had mentioned about 320 kilometers. This would be easy to demand. But according to the original survey, it has to be easy to Kelma, which stretches about 392 kilometers. So we are dropping about uh, 16, 62 kilometers. 72, something like that. So, I would also like to uh, know how the, the rest of the kilometers have been dropped from this uh, uh, governor's address because they have mentioned only 320, it has been 392 kilometers. I also would like to touch upon, honorable speaker, sir, the para 25 of the governor's address. Uh, we are happy that the government is determined to establish the uh, Medical College Kohima. It is actually overdue, long overdue that the government has mentioned this. But uh, the government has become a little ambitious that mentioning that they attempt, attempting to convert into uh, an institution like Reams and Ames. I think first thing first, honorable speaker sir, we must start attending, we must start the institution first. Let us see the medical college with our own eyes, touch with our own hand, or visit with our own feet. Then only let us talk about, uh, you know, converting into a rim slide, an end slide, which is a, a standard too high at the moment before we start. But what is important here is, what I would like to mention is, during the COVID, the time, 2019-20, there was uh, a lot of halabula for the health issues and uh, the government at that point of time was kind enough to pursue for another medical, another medical college in Mon district. I mean Mon, Mon town, Mon district. But in this governor's address, it was not found, uh, nothing has been mentioned here. And therefore, the uh, Honorable Minister in charge of medical health and family welfare may be uh, curious to know, not only me, but uh, how this own medical college, the, the progress, how it has been dropped from this uh, Honorable Governor's address. Uh, I would like to supplement what uh, my leader has said about the police, the law and order. The Honorable Deputy CM in charge of home may like to uh, uh, respond to this, that there was a firing on the 18th of, 18th of March, 18th of March, between the two factions, the NSCN led by Kango, another one led by Isa. Now, uh, we wish to know the status of which faction is being dealt by the Nagaland government or government of India. And also, this is this ceasefire 
uh, monitoring cell of this uh, group is located in the public place, honorable speaker said. Even automatic rifle, you know, all those are being fired at home. The life of the public are being in danger. Uh, I must come across any action being taken, any report being given by the police forces. What is the action taken so far? And uh, what is the status? Honorable Deputy CM in charge of home may like to respond. I think this is important because this uh, is about, we are talking about safety of our people. This, uh, this has to be looked into. <coughs> Honourable Speaker, sir, I would like to conclude. The last point is about the uh, ULP, the ULP election, urban local bodies. Well, this we have tried when the, my party was in government in 2017, and uh, as per the directive from the Honourable Supreme Court of India, we have tried announcing the election, we have uh, gone ahead, but unfortunately, the response from our people was too violent. Honorable Speaker, sir, you are fully aware that uh, many houses, including some government buildings, were burned down. The candidates, the candidates uh, were excommunicated. The, 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 the house of the candidates were made vandalized. And most of all, Honorable Speaker, sir, two young gentlemen, Life will lost. Now, despite of having all this uh, knowledge with the government, they went ahead announcing the election to conduct, and uh, the, the, the notification was issued on the 9th of, uh, 9th of March to go ahead with the election. Civil societies, various organizations have been protesting, asking for amendment. <coughs> of some of the portions of the municipal life to cause one. So far, we have not satisfied the demands of these civil societies. Now, Honorable Speaker, sir, if we go ahead with the election, as already announced by the government today, <coughs> then more further division among the people will come, more violent, there will be chaos and confusion, and we never know what will happen. And Foreseeing such situations, if government is even determined to go ahead, <coughs> who will be held responsible, Honorable Speaker, sir? As far as my party is concerned, we have already issued an official statement that till a consensus is arrived among the Dhamma people, this has to be kept on hold because I'm aware that there's a directive from the government of India. But as far as electionary is concerned, for hill, hill areas like Nagaland and other states, the rail phone comes in uh, as on the, on the, with the onset of uh, monsoon like May onwards, till October. So that would be one critics. But as far as municipal election is concerned, town council election is concerned, honorable speaker, sir, it is confined within the town. We don't need to go through those rough, damn road. Uh, where, you know, a good weather is required to conduct election. So that would be, uh, it, it cannot be an excuse that uh, it has to be conducted. One. Two. Since there is uh, a directive, it has to be, the, the election has to be held. But the question is, if we are going to repeat the same episode of 2017, Honorable Speaker, sir, what will be the situation of our people? And therefore, I would like to urge upon the government to rethink on this notification because now today is 23, 23, 23. Only about uh, 10 days to go for nomination. The first day of the nomination starts on the 3rd of November, uh, April, which ends on the 10th of uh, April. So time is running short. And therefore, a, a broad based consultation is required with the civil societies. A consensus has to be arrived at. Then only we can go ahead. Otherwise, if there is a variation of opinion among the civil society, immediately that matter has to be taken to the government of India and the Supreme Court. That look, this is a situation, and we had this episode in the past, this story in the past, and we don't want to repeat this. And therefore, we should be given enough time to console our people, 
then only we make a decision. One thing I would like to remind the of government is there was also an amendment of the, the reservation of the office of the chairperson for women in the ensuing municipal town council election 2023. Uh, now, this, to me, as already mentioned, it has been proven beyond doubt that our women folk are also equally <coughs> capable, they have the ability to compete with the women, uh, I mean, with, with men folk. And it has been really demonstrated by two of our women, uh, lady friends here, Ikani and Sulutin. As far as reservation is a 23% is reserved, concern, it is also still yet to be debated. But, again, if we are reservation, there is a reservation within the reservation. I think it is actually a discrimination. Once elected, they are also equally capable of competing for the chairperson post. When our people are not even yet to accept even the 33% reservation, again, we are going ahead reservation for a chairperson's post. I think this is where we have to think very seriously because this way we are pushing our people again uh, back to the world. So therefore, these are the area of concern that I have raised. I am uh, I'm in agreement with my leader that we have already submitted a letter of support to this government and we are thankful to our honorable